so tonight's closing lecture, I'm not going to say anything about saving the best to last or anything like that. It's on the pitch. And I'm uh, delighted to welcome Peter Evans. Peter and I started at Mars, I think, about exactly at the same time. Peter, uh, Peter's background, he's an advisor here in the IT communications and entertainment, the ICE practice. Um, Peter has a lot of experience working with early stage venture backed uh, technology companies and public, publicly traded companies in software, internet services, online media, and telecom sectors. And I can name some of the companies that he has worked with BCE, Canada, Platespin as VP Marketing, Flow Network, which was acquired by DoubleClick, and he's a founder of Riverdale Partners. But Peter has evolved a, uh, I guess, a specialty within the Mars practice, and, and that's as our pitch coach. Uh, and he works with companies across all of our practices. And, and I think we've mentioned in the past, we have uh, Mars Angels. We have a series of events where angels come, and we screen companies to do pitches three companies at each event. Uh, and in many cases, Peter is involved in coaching those companies. And I've been in here on the weekends, and I don't want to draw any parallels to the Phantom of the Opera, but you know that sing! Well, Peter is in there, get that pitch ready, get it ready. And, and he has coached companies, as I say, all sectors. We've had winners at, you know, we. The Royal We. He's coached winners at CIX. He's coached Upstart winners. He's coached winners at TyQuest. He's coached uh, companies going down to the Valley, to New York VCs. Um, and so we thought we'd ask him to try and codify what messages does he give to all those companies as to what makes a really great pitch. So, without further ado, over to Peter. Great. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Hello again, folks. Uh, great to be back uh, for this particular season, Event 101. I, I usually do the marketing uh, side of the equation in this program. It's great to come back and do this on the pitch. And, um, you know, I feel good about doing this because I'm passionate about the art of the pitch and uh, all of the information that we have to convey in a very short time to investors. But at the same time, I want to be respectful that what I'm about to show you tonight is not uh, just a quick fix to the pitches that you're doing. We're still learning how to pitch. I'm learning how to pitch as an angel uh, investor, as a, an entrepreneur. When I start ventures, uh, when I am teaching other entrepreneurs, we are all learning this as we go along. So I want to make it very clear that this is not the only definitive guide on pitching. And you have to look at a million different sources of that information. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you a way to do the pitch, sort of textbook style, 12 minute version that we typically do in the Mars group when we present companies to our angels and investors in our circle. I'm also going to throw in a special treat for you tonight because we're going to see actual pitches. And what's even cooler is we have a couple of the CEOs who did those pitches. And the three pitches you're going to see tonight, two of those CEOs are here. Um, they got money, and big money. So uh, nothing, you can't argue with success. And these guys have done uh, a heck of a job uh, that I think you'll, you'll agree with me when you see. I want to talk about a couple of key things here. Um, your job as a CEO, uh, to quote Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz, I love his blog post that you can find online. He talks about your mission as a CEO. It's really three things. I love how he clarifies. It's about setting a vision for the company. It's about being able to be a magnet for talent and have people find you. That's advisors as well as management team. And it's the ability to track money. If you run out of cash, you're dead. You've probably heard that a number of times on the stage from other people that know what they're talking about with raising capital. When you move to other people's money, that's where the fun begins. It, it really fundamentally changes everything. It's not your money anymore. It's not even money you're taking from the bank. I mean, that's, that's one thing. I don't want to marginalize the bank relationship. But it's really different when you've got an individual that's got their money in it. 
One of the reasons we have problems as entrepreneurs is we're trying to get to yes, but anybody that's doing a, a fair number of deals is probably seeing a fair number of pitches. They're trying to get to no as fast as possible. It's an efficiency problem. So we have a fundamental paradox in terms of how we actually address one another in this cycle. And when you actually break it down a little bit more, as we try to uh, find that right match, we're looking uh, for the right investor as entrepreneurs. We're looking for capacity. Do you have funds to invest? Is there compatibility? Um, geographic scope, uh, size, where you are, strategic. Are you, do you have a relevant portfolio? Are there other like investments? If you've done an investment like what I'm showing you here, are they friendly? Do they have competitive investments? We've got a screen for that. And lastly, um, do they have a successful track record as an investor? It's generally a good proxy for success. On the other side, what's interesting is investors are looking for team. Probably the most important attribute of what you bring to the table. They're looking for a sizable and addressable market. The IP and business model needs to be there as well as traction, early customers, partners, and as well a platform. What kind of significant technological advantages do you bring or significant advantages relative to business model? So this is how we're kind of evaluating each other on both sides and actually creates a lot of tension, creates a lot of conversation. There's a lot of selling involved. But fundamentally, what we're really trying to get to when we go to yes is we're trying to connect emotionally, rationally, and financially. It's called hearts, minds, and wallets. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. So I'm going to teach you a bit tonight some of the secrets that we use at Mars when we prepare companies. So let's look at the components of an investor pitch here. I'm probably going to go through two bottles of water up here tonight. First of all, I've broken this down just to four things that you need to know. Again, like I said, I don't want to marginalize how important and how comprehensive a pitch needs to be. But if I had to break it down into just four essential elements, it would be these. You've got to focus on a problem that matters. You've got to find an attractive market that's going to pay you for what you've created. You've got to find a unique advantage that really works in the marketplace that you've assembled a, a basket of competencies and technologies and such that really allow you to go out there and, and rule the market. And lastly, a compelling investment offer. The structure of the deal, how much money you need, it has to be palatable to the investor. The pacing of the pitch, if I was to just call it on a sort of standardized measure, you're really looking at about three minutes to get into the real problem. You're looking at about four minutes to prove that you've got an attractive market. You've got about three minutes to show some degree of unique advantage and, f and two minutes for a compelling investment to cap it off at the end in terms of financials and uh, the offer. Again, guidelines, I want to stress that. You may be in a position where you've got 15 or 20 minutes to talk to the investor, but I would tell you this, if you can actually keep it to a timing of around 12 minutes, I think that's going to put you in good shape because you're going to get moved around by investors in the conversations that happen prepare to be interrupted. Often they'll say, listen, how do you want to do this? The investor will say that. And I've seen this happen so many times. I know our CEOs have. Uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want to just uh, show the slides? You sit, you sit down in their boardroom, you've set up, you've plugged in. Um, and I'll just, I'll just sit back and I'll, I'll, how long do you think it's going to be? Oh, well, we've got about 12 minutes or so. Slide number one, they're on you, just like white on rice. <laughs> it's nuts. All of a sudden, you're, you're in a ping pong, uh, sorry, a pinball effect. It's actually not a linear progression anymore. You're moving uh, to slide four now. Oh, that's covering an eight. Well, can I see slide eight? Let's get into that now. Well, that's the investor. They want to see stuff in a nonlinear way. If you have these things that tight on 12 minutes, it's going to be more helpful. If your pitch is 45 minutes, that is extremely hard to adapt on the fly to investors when they interrupt you. So you need tight slides that really get the job done. So let's get into this. The real problem, we are focusing on the so what at this point. What we're trying to talk about here in these first three minutes is setting up uh, the core value proposition in a single sentence. So I'm going to show you an example of how you can actually get that job done very quickly using Lisa Crossley's presentation at Quantum Dental. You want to focus on the unique benefit as well, that big idea. You need some sort of a metaphor. Um, you know, I, there's a uh, you, you want to actually use a sort of movie pitch type thing. X meets, uh, X meets Y. We are X meets Y. Two things that we're bringing together that actually completes a compelling solution for the market. 
You actually want to draw those cognitive associations. So the movie pitch is actually beautiful if you can force some metaphors. The emotion, you want to actually at this point use a photo in the background or other visual aids that actually force a visceral emotional response. You know you're on the right track on that first slide if they go, you get positive body language, they're, they're nodding, and you sometimes get, wow, that's cool. Okay, I get it, this is really gonna be good. And they kind of ease back, and you can just tell they're gonna enjoy the rest of the show. So, when you get to the problem, you've gotta talk about insanity to a certain degree. It's that whole, I'm mad as hell as an entrepreneur and I'm not going to take it anymore. It's that kind of approach that you've gotta take and really try to paint the insanity of the market problem. The historical evolution is important too. So what's actually gone on that's changed in the customer's mindset? Why did they not buy cloud computing before? Somebody had to make that pitch at Amazon or is in the cloud uh, uh, business today and is talking about all of the elements that have come together. So the price of MIPS and, and how storage is coming down, all these other things had to come together to make it worthwhile doing because they've seen those kind of pitches in the past. Personas, who are the main players in your market? Describe them more vividly uh, and paint a picture of those customers as personas. And I encourage you to look at personas, Google that and understand a bit more about the practice of building them. Use pictures. The Stones got it right. Every picture tells a story, don't it? When you look at the solution, you're really using a lot of screenshots, a lot of product photos. I'm actually amazed at how few screenshots and visual aids are provided in the presentations I see when somebody talks about their solution. Especially if you're selling software, screenshots are really important. And if you don't have screenshots, you probably be shouldn't, shouldn't be presenting uh, to an investor. You should probably rethink just where you are. Even just some basic uh, screenshots of a a dirty prototype are important. The functionality is important in terms of the who is in the scene and what are they doing with the product to maybe illustrate what we call a who-do effect. Dave Gray from X-Plane has coined that and looks at that as a sort of storyboard, a visual storyboard. I often find many entrepreneurs do not do that well in terms of showing how the solution fits into an average customer's day. So try a day in the life uh, concept. The benefits, the high level value, the category that you play in. You may want to show your solution in terms of how it fits into adjacent categories. Very important because they will move you into that discussion later. And what is the readiness of your solution? Is it alpha? Is it just in wireframes? Is it beta? Have you got trial customers on there? You have to be uh, authentic. You've got to be credible with people and actually not misrepresent the state of readiness of your product when you're talking about solution. This is very simple here in terms of the traction slide to state what you've done, but you really need to dig deep and think about some of the things that matter to investors. When were you founded? They want to know how long you've been working on the problem. They want to understand if you've hired any employees. It's another thing that conveys uh, commitment as well as offices and leases that may have been signed. The product release, as I said, where is it? The beta users, do you have unique views? Do you have registrations that you can show? You may not have paying customers, but you've got to show proxies of success that actually lead up and show that you've got some degree of traction. At the same time, have you got partnerships that you brought into play? Are there partners in the wings that are ready to come on when the, part, when the product is actually ready to ship? Have you won any industry awards? Have you applied for awards? Have you been nominated for awards? Whatever you have that you can show that, that indicates traction again. Media coverage is great. Uh, if the media are interested, that is sometimes a good thing uh, and, and shows that it might be a little bit easier to market your product uh, than the investor thinks. And lastly, patents are, are often a nice sweetener. As, as Joe Lewis said about money, you know, I don't like money, but I sleep better at night with money. And it's that whole notion of uh, sleeping better. I think patents, again, and we'll talk about that in the next section, um, are, are another thing that really needs to be put up front if you're actually in that. So what we're looking at just on this is we're really saying that our team is committed and it can execute based on visible proof and proxies that we brought into play. I'm going to move through these slides very, very quickly. We're just going to do a quick case study on Quantum Dental with uh, Lisa Crossley. So this is a company, actual slides. You saw it here first. Um, this is how she sets up the problem. Look at this. 
existing tooth decay diagnostics. These are x-rays that are being done in the dental office. Less than 50% of the time, they, they accurately predict tooth decay. So the detection of tooth decay, those x-rays that we're taking, radiation, all that hassle, are, are not working the way they need to, and that's what quantum dental has done. They've actually fundamentally changed uh, the detection methods to complement x-rays and visual methods. So this is interesting. What she's done is she's shown how dentistry hasn't changed in 50 years. It's actually more. I think it's closer to 60. And we just happened to luck out. We found a picture that looks like the same girl, you know, and uh, brought forward. It actually looks like somebody's done that in Photoshop, but it's actually real. So she set up the problem. Over here now, she shows a picture of the product. So that's why we invented the Canary system. And you'll see that she's a software play that actually integrates with a hardware play. So it's, it's health IT. And she needs to vividly paint a picture of that to show how the software and the patient printed reports uh, complement the system. And she says, OK, well, now, big problem. I've shown you a little bit of product. It's a tease. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But now I just want to show you a little bit about who Quantum is. What we do, we've developed a new platform which uses a low-powered laser to detect tooth decay, dot, dot, dot. These are our milestones. We have product, we have customers, we have IP, we have clinical trials underway and partnerships. The last phase after who they are and what they've done is what they're in the meeting for. Too many entrepreneurs walk in and they don't at some point in the front end of the presentation state the purpose of the meeting. Restate it. We know you're there for money if we're investors. But you have to restate your position. It's very professional. How much have you raised to date? How much are you seeking? And how do you intend to use those funds? So you can see there, 3.3 million. These are real numbers. She's raised her uh, round to 2.5 million and closing it. In fact, the, the round is oversubscribed on the quality of this company and also the quality of the presentation that she's doing. She's using it for sales marketing to support launch, large-scale manufacturing, because she needs to get these units built now at scale. And she's looking for some final regulatory approvals. How do you like Lisa Crossley so far with Quantum Dental? You want to hear a really funny story? We showed these slides with Lisa's permission to another entrepreneur who is at Mars, uh, one of our companies in our incubator. And he's a fairly wealthy angel investor as well. I won't name him, because you'll all go up and find him later. Um, he's had three exits. He saw this and he goes, I think I want to invest in this company. I love this pitch. So he called Lisa up and they actually had a meeting. So it was quite funny actually what can happen. She gets on to market problems and I'm not going to read all these, but I just want to give you a sort of visual array on how to structure the pitch. You can actually talk about where dentists are concerned in this model right now. What's wrong with the market with dentists? Patients on the other side. And then in the center, how current detection methods are lacking. All these slides will be distributed later on the portal, by the way. I want to point that out. And on the value proposition, she really talks about th uh, three major entities here, players in this. The value to the dentist to attract new patients, more patient visits, reduce costs, and, and it's also affordable with flexible leasing options as hardware can be leased. And the value to the patients and insurers is that it reduces costly and painful restorations. So very, very simply, she's dealt with all the players in this ecosystem, and she's very clearly outlined the top line benefits in a really, really tight slide. So then she transitions over and says, OK, so let me just take you through a little bit about what the Canary System's all about. Then she shows the product, Home Shopping Network style. It worked beautifully in the meeting. People love to see the real product. If you are working on a physical product and you don't bring it to the meeting, it, it's suspect. I, I, you know, I actually saw a pitch today in Waterloo uh, at the Canada 3.0 conference, and they didn't pull the product out till the end of the session when they could have used it as a prop for the whole thing. So make sure you get that out on the table as fast as possible. We want to see tangible proof that you've got something. So that's the Canary console with components. We said get a big shot there and give us some very high-level cutaways of what the components are. It's a software solution, so she shows the other side of the solution. And then, lastly, I'm going to close off on this. Lisa takes us through how the product gets used in that system today of how a dentist's office works with a patient. This is very important. What we're seeing here is really an interaction layer 
of, of, uh, of dentist and patient and how it works. And essentially what we're seeing here is this whole notion of advanced enamel decay and the standard model of what we call drill, bill, is drill, fill, and bill, which is what dentists call it in the industry, is actually going to change by using remineralization therapies that go along with this diagnostic tool that can better predict tooth decay under the enamel surface. So let's get to the next section here of the four that we're going to talk about. You've developed something really great. A lot of people have that, but now it's about willingness to pay. How big is the market? Can it scale? These are the questions we ask of entrepreneurs. Is there lots of room in that market potentially even to not only scale the business, but will it support multiple players? Other people that may be fast followers that may imitate you or large gorillas that may want to roll over with a similar product and try to take you out, not necessarily buy you. You've got to show that the market is sizable, it's very big, and that you can get to it. At the end of the day, I mentioned multiple players, but what's the reasonable market you can serve with the kind of product that you've invented? The addressability, it's not just about the size of the market. You want to look at formative forces and trends. One of the models I use is political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental, uh, as well as capital, call it PESLEC. And it's actually covered in one of my marketing lectures on the portal as well. These are great lenses that you can actually focus your product development and how you've approached the market through. Say it with charts, keep it extremely engaging, pie charts, graph charts, keep it high level. Segments, are you going niche or are you going broad? Um, you gotta be really careful about those top down numbers where you say it's a hundred billion dollar market, if we could just get one percent, that's what we forecast. We have got a huge market opportunity in front of us now with that 1%. You'll get thrown out of the meeting right there. That's one of the biggest rookie moves that we actually see. Ground up analysis. Talk about global or at least be prepared to address how you're going to move beyond Canada, beyond the US, and how this may play out in Asia and in Europe. And if there are any problems, are there regulatory frameworks that make a difference? Are the buyers different? Do they really need this in other areas of the world? These are important questions. And often entrepreneurs just completely ignore this and don't even talk to somebody that might understand how this is going to be viewed in Bangalore or in Shanghai. And these are people that we see almost every day that could just be a lend an ear. You gotta use th third party reports. It's very important to go out there and, and use the kind of research that we provide through Mars. Uh, companies like IDC, Gardner, Forrester, um, these are, are great analyst reports that you can pull um, at little to no cost through Mars, and you should avail yourself of those resources if you're writing a business plan. That third party proof is important, but don't load up the pitch with too much of that data because we always, as investors, tend to discount that. At the end of the day, you want to be thinking about thought leadership. You want to, in some way, too, the best entrepreneurs will do their own independent study of the market and will show that they've done primary research that nobody else has. That they have, as a thought leader, developed some proprietary advantage that gives them a right to go and, and rule the market. This is very important, the concept of thought leadership as it relates to discussing the market with investors. Early customers and prospects are very important. We need to know the status of where they are. You've got to talk to the number of trials underway. Are they paid versus free? Paying customers is always better. Again, categorize them. What kind of segments are we looking at? Contextualize why they bought. Tell us a story. Here you can actually float a quote in there as to why they bought. Keep it tight, but it's a great way to personify what you're actually doing. Logos are important too. I've seen that done well and I've seen it done really bad. Logo soup, not good. You do not want to put 50 logos out there that are uncategorized because I don't know how PricewaterhouseCoopers relates to ExxonMobil. If you put a logo, those two logos together, two very different industries. So if there's a vertical or a niche focus, especially with your product, the categorization of your customers in that needs to reflect that. The evangelists, customer quotes are great. They validate the market pain and size. So getting to making money at this, we move into the revenue model. Key metrics around pricing, average deal size, your registrations, the number of subscriptions, how much churn are you looking at in terms of your model? What have you forecast? 
I, I often see churn not even for, uh, built into any forecast. What's the lifetime value of a customer? How long do you expect them to, to, to pay you? The cost to acquire is probably one of the most overlooked uh, issues in the decks that I see. It's uh, an important metric because often it's why businesses fail, not understanding the fundamental cost of how, how you're going to uh, get visibility in the market, get them interested in your product, and then convert them into a paying customer and then sustain them for a certain amount of time. And at the same time, is your model sustainable from a competitive point of view? You've got to point that out inside this area of the model. When we get to marketing and sales, you really want to say here that you've got the marketing programs, you've got the marketing systems to drive visibility in the marketplace, that you can actually generate real leads and that you can close sales. That's how we get the job done in this area of the, the pitch. So the most visible proof that uh, there's a market for your solution is really customers at the end of the day. If you've seen an investor and they're saying uh, words that, you know, really means they're not interested, it's often because, you know, call me when you get a couple of customers on this. I love it. It sounds great. But once we've got a couple of customers, I'd really like to go over it with you again. You'll hear that a lot. It's in many cases uh, that, that whole pre-revenue segment. Many VCs, for instance, don't want to touch it for obvious reasons. It's very risky. They want to see that validation. You've got to actually show um, visibility. In marketing and sales, it's all about visibility, especially if you're in software. You need to have an inbound marketing program that supports visibility. What is your unique story? How are you going to generate leads? You've got to stay high level in terms of the presentation as well. I'm not going into too much on this, but are you going to have a, a systems model of CRM? Are you using Salesforce.com? Are you using HubSpot? I'm amazed at how many people say that they're going to have a viral marketing program, that they're going to rely on a lot of search engine optimization uh, techniques to actually drive, and I saw one today, 30,000 registrations a month from zero, and 54 million top line by the end of 2012. Saw it today. Not a Mars client. I want to point that out. I did not laugh, and we had a very serious chat about what goes on underneath that? Are you using Eloqua? Are you using HubSpot? Are you using uh, you know, Meltwater? Are you using tools, CRM? Like, what, what's going to run all this? You need marketing automation at some point. You've got to prototype this in a manual way first and nail it, and then you've got to scale it. But he had no understanding of the sales systems required to get to those levels of uh, sales. So at the end of the day, are you testing? Are you doing A-B splits? Are you testing multiple offers? Have you really looked at a way that you're going to pivot if certain types of marketing messages don't work, are you agile in that way? Um, and at the end of the day, um, this is where most companies fail, marketing and sales. It's way beyond the technology, and I've talked a lot about that in previous lectures. Let me take you through uh, a man who needs little introduction, Kirk Simpson, who's in the audience with Wave Accounting. I'm just going to do a really bad job of his pitch for a second, just in the interest of time, and Kirk's going to come up later and talk Q&A with people. But just when we look at how Kirk actually did his pitch with respect to answering these questions, this module is done brilliantly. And again, it's, it's not just what's on the slide, it's how it's laid up. It's the visual array of complex points that you need to get across. This is why it's so helpful. When I show it to entrepreneurs, a real slide, they go, oh, I know what you're doing now. I can overtype this. Well, not quite, but... You know, it, it, if you can stay within this word count and keep it punchy, it gives you a really good leg up on trying to do something like market opportunity. Free agent nation, 25.5 million, million people in North America that lack competency in the area of accounting. They're looking for control of their expenses, and they have a strong desire to be organized. Big market, it gets the job done. It is, wave accounting is at the forefront of powerful trends. The explosion in software as a service, paper is moving to digital, we have wireless technology and the, the rate of adoption on wireless with smartphone is explosive as well as a trend towards collaborative consumption where if I can actually do my accounting on WAVE, I can collaborate with other small, uh, medium-sized businesses that use the, the platform to better understand how my expenses track to national averages and other things like that. I can also collaborate around other sorts of information to make better decisions on my spending. To further reinforce the fact that there's a big market, he pulls out a couple of big names. 
So he talks about Mike McDermott's success, a former Mars client at FreshBooks. Many of you probably even using that right now. It's just a, an unbelievable success locally here. And he talks about how Mint is also doing uh, big things or was doing big things and then was acquired by Intuit. This appeals to something we call investor greed because they're actually starting to look at the exit possibilities already. You're just activating that part of their brain. He then goes on to talk about the revenue model as being something that's about targeted offers and research. So he's actually looking at the aggregate data that's going on. He's actually inserting offers like Google does in a very contextual way right into the workflow that they're doing in their accounting. And these are offers that people really want to see. These are things that matter to them because they're actually in context. At the same time, they have ability to draw trends and aggregated research that's very valuable data, not on individual users, but on the whole wave accounting network that's very valuable as a monetization model. And then he looks at a couple of other areas where he says, you know, over time, it's not our primary, but we've got all sorts of opportunities for premium products and tax returns later on through partnerships or direct uh, software development and marketing. So again, you kind of get an idea that Kirk's onto something big as you, and, and that he's got a graduated, organized way of going to market with this venture. And then he hits you with a nice sucker punch here because he says, we are launching without fail on November the 16th, and I'm going to put the date right in my presentation, which was a little trick that, uh, that Kirk had, which worked beautifully for me when I saw it. Uh, it just showed commitment to that launch date, which he did not miss, even though he had to really get some IP moving there. Um, inside joke, sorry. Um, so uh, on, on this, he shows how they're going to capture customers and how they're going to retain them through PR, social media partnerships, vertical communities, advertising. You get the drill. Again, nicely shown in two, two aspects, not just how they're going to capture them, but how they're going to retain them and move some other programs into place. Number three. This is sometimes called unfair advantage. I'm using the word unique advantage because we're Canadian, we don't like to be unfair. Actually, that's not true. I just thought that unique advantage maybe nailed it a bit more, but I like unfair. I like where you've actually got a former Google executive or a, formal, for, uh, a former uh, you know, Intel executive in semiconductors. If you're doing the next semiconductor play, that's unfair. You want to be looking for that texture where you can actually tell a story that says you've got all those essential pieces into place and you've really put in something that is just clearly unfair in the marketplace. So let me show you how you do that. You've got to punch above your weight. From a partnership point of view, you've got to be looking at partners in a big way. What value will they add to your solution? Partners can either hurt you, they can actually uh, you know, catch up to you in the marketplace or they can actually work with you. But you should have a partnership story generally for most ventures that are going to scale because you often can't do it alone. So what role will they play uh, in terms of research? Are they going to be into the development side, contract manufacturing? Is it a sales or a support role? What reputation do they have in the market? So if you are putting partners up, are they notables? Are they reference partners that are going to signal to the industry that you're onto something? The category fit, do they have sufficient power in that category to make things happen and are they even culturally aligned with the kind of product that you're trying to sell. We've seen a lot of M&A activity recently that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I know those, uh, those companies were former partners but now that they own that IP may not be moving it all that well into the market because there's cultural uh, issues with the sales force and such. Uh, investors, you know, they ask around. They're very attuned to whether or not those partnerships make sense or whether you've just been opportunistic and haven't done a lot of homework and you just wanted to get a deal signed and another press release on the website because you were worried about momentum, okay? The executive sponsorship's important with uh, partners. Uh, somebody's got to be driving that on the inside of the partner side and as well, there's got to be some incentives that are aligned. I often see revenue forecasts and revenue models that are not built for channel. You have, in some cases, missed a 20 or 30 or 40% spiff that the channel needs to actually move your product. Don't miss that. And on the longer term, are they a competitive threat to you or are they potentially M&A? Because often those partnerships are the, the logical M&A um, hookups later. On the technology side, you want to validate how you're different. Uh, how much of a market lead you have and to what degree uh, you can leverage 
and scale the technology that you've got today? Are there unique processes to how you're doing things? It's not just about the technology. You may have a process patent that's potentially in the works. Have you licensed the technology? I'm going to show you an example of how Jad uh, Gani at uh, Verold has done uh, his IP in the next uh, couple of slides. But you must state any components that are in there and be transparent about how you've brought your solution together if there's third-party code in there. It doesn't have to be in the pitch here. But remember, you most likely will be asked about open source and if there's certain types of files that have been dragged over that, are, uh, that need to be looked at differently by the investor when we we're thinking about pri proprietary advantage. And then what's the focus of your IP strategy? At the end of the day, is it uh, provisional filing? Is it actually uh, patent granted? Where are you with that? If you have not filed the provisional, say so. It's not a bad thing, but talk to why you want to file it and how you're going to do it. And you definitely don't want to meet with an investor before you've actually spoken to an IP attorney. This is very important. You, you should name the person that you're going to work with and maybe by then have at least selected who's going to do your IP work. And as I've said here, it's not bad to mention who you're working with as well if it's a name brand. Uh, investors talk to these attorneys and they in some cases can validate that you're really onto something. Short of doing prior art and things like that, they can be very helpful in raising money. The team is perhaps the most important part of the whole deck. I can't overemphasize the importance of communicating that you have the right background. Talk about the companies that you've actually worked for in the past, and if you haven't got corporate experience, talk about your academic experience and your customer experience. The planned hires is not just what, who's in the company today, but who you intend to hire. Sometimes I'll see a very astute investor say, do you have a job description for that person after we give you the money? Like, do you know who you want right now? Sometimes they'll just say, uh, they won't ask about a job description in most cases, but it's great to have one in your back pocket that you can actually show them or give them something that sort of gives them a sense that you're going to do something pro proper with their money. So speak to where you're going from a planned hired, uh, hire perspective. Be prepared to show some sort of an organization chart. Again, what's your vision for how this organization is going to grow? The achievements, what actually uniquely qualifies these people that you have assembled, you and others, and your advisors, uh, what gives them a unique advantage in terms of advising you or helping build that product for the market you're looking to serve? Very, very important. I don't want to overlook the importance of if the team's not built, the advisory board becomes even more important. And let's not even call it an advisory board. In the early days, they're advisors. We haven't formed a board. There's no governance. This is a very important point. But I, uh, it's probably a, one of the biggest failures of entrepreneurs is that they have not really uh, shown the investor that they have the ability to attract uh, talent. And, not, and that talent doesn't have to be hires. It can be consultants and it can be advisors. If, you, if you're actually saying, listen, if I have the money, I can get these people, but I've got this amazing advisor over here who was C, CEO of XYZ, and he loves what we're doing, we actually think, uh, the investor thinks that you're onto something. This is a very key point. So going through Verold with uh, Jad Yagi's um, venture, which was in the uh, development space for 3D tools, they're automating 3D. How cool is that? It's really two words as a tagline. And when they go into competitors, they're doing just a standard uh, chart to show, and I, I've dropped the logos, some of the naughty bits have been taken out of here but they've actually gone against manual tools, automated tools, and other scanners. And again, it's not about understanding all of this, but understanding the syntax and how you lay it up. This is just a standard um, you know, X and Y chart, and just, uh, or a grid rather, but you can also use X and Y charts as well. I usually see X and Y charts done badly, so I haven't put one in here. I'm happy to throw some in additionally for the portal later, but uh, for the most part, they're done very badly and they're usually too simplistic for investors. Often they don't want to see this. They'll move you on through the presentation, but w the way you generally present this slide is, and relative to our competitors, yada, 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 and you're done. You're, you're really just saying, we have it. You're really in and out of it in probably about 20, 30 seconds. The IP portfolio, um, as Jad lays it up here, I like the fact that he properly discloses you know, what has been licensed IP as well as the IP that's developed by Verol. 
So their R&D was conducted by a top, uh, at a top German university in the computer graphics lab, one of the best centers of excellence you could find for the kind of technology they've developed. And that the CTO was in the movie. So Matthew Slaby was there in Germany developing that technology at the university. And then going through a description of the patents that they have. So this is a company that has uh, raised millions and is on its way beautifully, but, and it is very much an IP play, which is why we've used Verol. And uh, unfortunately, time permitting, I can't show you all of the wonders of their technology, but uh, um, it's a story you want to follow. On the team and advisors, again, this looks fairly detailed, but it's so easy to navigate. What you've got is just the positions that these people are playing on the management team, their backgrounds, and you want to be as simple as, you know, uh, internationally recognized digital artist with work in the collection of the National Gallery of Canada. Good enough for me. Okay, great. I might actually take another meeting with this kind of a team. As I read through this, the kind of advisors they've got, it's great. This is about as simple as it needs to be. We don't need big paragraphs or, or life stories. And remember, when they go into due diligence, they'll be looking at resumes and bios later. So again, we just want to get the next meeting. Number four, I'm going to move this through, through this quite fast because it, it gets fairly complex as a discussion. It's a good one for Q&A, but the compelling investment, we use a word called upside. What is the upside if I actually invest in this venture? Presenting your offer in a very clear way is, is really the way to cap off a good investor presentation. Really two components of this, your key numbers, your revenues, your expenses, how much is on the back end as an EBITDA, as well as customers and headcount, very important. People will often look at the number of customers and say, well, I, I now I understand how much the revenue per order is, and you know what, I, everything looks right, but when I go into customers, I don't think you can do the 30,000 registrations a month. So that's important. The headcount, how do you think you can do 54 million by the end of 2012 with eight people? You know, that, that's better than any ratio in any industry. So, you know, at 85% gross margin for software, I mean, there's only so much we can actually squeeze out in, in terms of productivity. It's very important. You'll generally be asked for that later, so you might as well lay it out if you can with the, the customers and headcount. I usually see it omitted out of most decks when I, I see the first pass. What's your burn rate? They will ask you when you will be out of cash uh, right now and then after investment. Uh, will this take you to break even? So you need to be able to defend those assumptions as well. And then the various scenarios. You need to speak to the impact of various scenarios. What if you don't get 30,000 and you get 15? Have you tested the sensitivity of that on, on what's going to happen to cash? What's going to happen to profits? What's going to happen to my investment as an investor? And how fast we're going to need more money? And are we going to have a down round? So these are very, very important metrics in terms of how they play out in terms of the attractiveness of this overall uh, business. And then on the ask, it's really now about structure. Now that I've shown you how much we can make, I want to show you what I'm looking for from you, Mr. and Mrs. Investor. So the investment structure in terms, are we looking at convertible debt? Are we looking at equity? Um, what are the terms of the deal at the end of the day? And then we want to make sure that we, at this stage, if it's a ballroom presentation, uh, I've seen this go badly where they start discussing valuation uh, on the podium in a group of people that are kind of mixed, some investors, maybe some not. Uh, but you don't want to negotiate with somebody around valuation and set precedent from the podium. That's very important. The way to move somebody on about valuation in a first meeting, it's generally better to say, I'd, I'd prefer to, to talk about that and, and we're, we're actually assessing what the valuation is right now. And, and really try to qualify their interest before you start setting numbers with them on that. That's very important because that's going to define how much share you're left with on the company. So what's the amount of the round? How much is being raised? You've got to talk about the use of proceeds and lay it out very clearly. Is it a sales and marketing round? Is there further development to be done on the product? If there is, and you say that the product is absolutely finished, what's going to happen? Lack, lack of credibility right there. It's one of the biggest areas where people try to misrepresent and sweep some of their mess under the carpet. Good investors know that there's always stuff to be done. It's called dot releases. <laughs> it's always going to happen. But you're, you're uh, trying to hide it is just going to make matters worse because it's going to blow your credibility. At the end of the day, how much does my money buy? 
you've got to state that as well. For an investor, they need to know what you're bridging to. Is it a bridge to nowhere? Uh, what if a few of those factors go out of sync? And can we actually adapt to change? And at the end of the day, you'll also be asked, what kind of interest have you seen already? Am I your first meeting? Who else have you met with? Um, you can actually answer the, I'll, I'll probably talk offline about how to answer some of those questions. But I think it's important that you convey momentum. If you're starting to build a book of investment, you may want to give them a sense of your status on that if they're not the first meeting. People like a herd mentality. People run with the herd. They don't want to be the first or the lead investor often. So to close off, I, I want to give you just seven things that I put together as I just sort of thought about how I look at a pitch, how I assess whether I would really come in as an investor. There's seven things that really do it for me. At the end of the day, I think it's about honesty. It's about straight answers to investor questions, not trying to hide stuff, um, being clear with your answers and not trying to look like you're hiding something or being evasive. It's about credibility on two levels really understands the customer in the market. If you've got prior experience in that market, that's always going to help. But your ability to maybe as, as a non-inside and uh, as a non-insider, your ability to learn quickly about that industry, I'm going to pick that up. And then are you driving thought leadership? Are you doing things in some way that are very different? Or are you communicating that as a thought leader? And we talked a bit about that. Are you resourceful? Uh, I once saw a presentation and they described themselves as the, most scra as the scrappiest startup in the DFJ portfolio. I thought that was a great way to actually get the crowd warmed up. And then they proved it to us through the balance of the presentation. Your ability to make a dollar go farther as an entrepreneur is very, very important. You have to show that in the presentation that you've been somewhat parsimonious with cash today. No Porsches. Logic. Are you making wise, pragmatic decisions? That's another way I assess you. Passion. No passion, no money generally. In fact, I talked to somebody at an angel group recently that's done a fair number of deals, and he said it's probably the biggest correlated factor is the passion that the entrepreneur exhibits for the business. Just, and because passion in many ways drives marketing, it drives sales, it drives media, it drives interest, it drives the acquisition of talent and advisors. Your ability to, to grab stuff and drag it into the enterprise is so important. And I, I've seen great technology where the passion just wasn't there on those things. So they couldn't really build a sustainable business. So at best, it might be a licensing play. Humility is very important. And the reason I say humility is it's about a fundamental trait that we look for that influences my ability to coach an entrepreneur through the process. And I'm looking for humility through the team. No prima donnas. Um, it's very important that we have that. And lastly, I'm looking for an ability to attract and lead a winning team. And that's evidenced by the team you built already. It's evidenced by the way advisors are talking about you. It's evidenced by the way your family might be talking about you as, as the first investors in your company. Very important. So lastly, I'm going to leave you with just a couple of tricks of the trade that I do when I work with uh, entrepreneurs. I call it storify, personify, simplify, disnify, and prove it at the end of the day. You got to tell a story. You got to engage investors. It's all about stories these days. And we see a lot of stuff in the media now. I heard a great line from Mark uh, Reagan uh, out of Chicago, who's arguably one of the top PR people on the planet. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, content is the new marketing. It's not, about, it's not about Twitter uh, feeds and speeds and all these new ways to actually communicate on the technology side. There has to be content at the end of the day. So we're now rushing back to quality. Kind of sounds like 1998 again, or, or 2008. Um, so with, with this rush to quality, we have to tell better stories. And there's an insane amount of clutter in your category if you look. So stories are a better way to engage people and focus on that. And if you don't understand storytelling, I encourage you to Google it and look it up because it's a really big art. You got to personify. Investors are in the people business. They need to relate to you as a person. Um, I, an investor who will re remain nameless uses a trick, and I think it's brilliant. He goes, tell me your story. I go, well, you know, we've invented a, a new cloud computing. No, no, no. Your story. 
I want to know your story. Where were you born? How long have you been? Where'd you go to school? And he starts getting into a personal discussion, completely throws him off guard. And now they get into the people business, because that's where he starts. It's all about the team. He's got one drum that he beats, as he says to me. And once, once that's proven, a lot of the other stuff falls into place. You've got to personify the venture, bring the team out, prima donna CEOs and four other people writing code and doing marketing that you can't see on a regular basis as an investor, that tends to frighten you. Simplify. Use frameworks instead of text where you can and bring things together in a graphical way that shows the interplay and the relationships of complex data. We don't have time to learn anymore. That's what somebody once said to me about some marketing work that I had done for a company. He says, I love the diagrams you guys are doing. It was at Flow Network back in 2000. This was a guy in Amsterdam that was actually stealing our diagrams and putting them into Dutch and other languages. And he said, I'm sorry about that, but I, uh, I just love your stuff and I, I don't have a good graphic artist. But he said, people don't have time to learn anymore. I love the way you use pictures to get complex products across, like uh, application uh, well, ASPs, so the original frameworks for SaaS, so what we were in. You got to Disneyfy. So really, it's about graphics where they make sense. And it's, it's Disneyfying and, and bringing graphics and photos and pictures to evoke a visceral, emotional response from the investor. Again, this is even more important when you move beyond the boardroom when you're trying to get a group of investors that are just kind of drive-by and there's a whole pile of people and you'll find yourselves in those sort of pitch competitions or ballroom presentations which have to be much more keynote-ish and more engaging and generally a little higher level. Disneyfying is great. At the end of the day, the one that I would hang my hat on is, is you're always going to be at every stage asked to prove why you said something before whether it's in that same meeting or later, you've always got to have that little guy that's sitting on your shoulder always saying, as evidenced by. If you can remember those three words, the importance of those, everything that you state needs evidence generally at some point, whether it's through due diligence or it's when you're doing your marketing campaign and, and sales and when you're talking to customers, you need evidence, you need proof. So try to bring as much into that as you can to really make sure that you've got something that's really solid. And that's it. Thank you very much. So we're good for time on questions. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I've got a couple of CEOs here as well, which I, and I'd love to get, get them to, to talk a little bit about uh, what they've learned through the process of doing pitches. And these are people that have raised money. So I'm, I'm happy to show you some real successes. And we've got quite a few of these now. I had a, a great field to pick from, but I picked from some of the best here. Um, in researching pitches, one of the articles that I ran across was Guy Kawasaki's rule of 10, 20, 30. Yeah. Right? Um, 10 pages, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Yeah. Even in the, the slides you're showing, I think it broke the rule several times. Mm -hmm. What well, is your version of that? I don't have a 10, 20, 30. I don't get paid $65,000 to do a keynote. I love Guy <laughs> Kawasaki. I've had breakfast with him, with Ian Klugman and a few other people. We had breakfast a number of years ago. Um, I wanted to ask him that question, uh, and I, I didn't get a chance, but I will. I have his email address. We've corresponded the odd time on some stuff, because if I get a question about Apple, I just deflect it to Guy. I don't answer any questions about Apple uh, for media. Uh, going back to your answer, I disagree fundamentally. I, I think it's great if you can get away with that, but we have to understand where we are. If you're doing a keynote presentation for a big ballroom and it's high level and you're doing something like Guy uses, a lot of images, big text. These are serious presentations with investors. Have you seen 30-point font and just how much you can communicate with that? Nope. It'll look like a really goofy keynote presentation. Your, your thank you, like I think, a, is 30-point. Is What's that? I think your thank you up there is 30 point. That's, yeah. So there's only so much that you can get. I can do thank you in 30, but when I need more detail, it gets really, really difficult. So first of all, I think it's, your, your question begs the, the response around who's the audience and, and what's the context of the meeting. Um, it's going to be highly interactive if it's, a, if it's a boardroom presentation. If it's a ballroom presentation, it demands a much more visual, keynote-ish uh, kind of presentation. And uh, you generally won't be stopped in that kind of a keynote presentation. Remember, 
Um, different styles for everybody, but the overall goal is to get that next meeting. So we're really just trying to spark interest, get some Q&A going after that session. If people can't see the, uh, you know, the slide very well, uh, that's a problem. I've got reduced uh, sizing on some of these slides here. Uh, and I, I didn't really want you to focus on the content of those slides that we used as examples. I actually wanted you to see the visual array more of how that slide's been laid up because that's actually what seems to help the entrepreneur the most. Yep. Oh, I get it. I know, how, I know what you're looking for now. So that goes there, this goes there. I, I've never seen anything like it. It's transformational once they see what an actual template looks like. But a lot of the pitch decks, that, a lot of the pitch presentations you see are really just a standard blah, blah, blah. Make sure you put that stuff in. I had to do that, but I wanted to show you some examples. So I fundamentally disagree with Guy Kawasaki, and I think it makes for a good sound bite, but I actually don't think it's practical. And I'll argue that with yeah. him. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. At what point, at what point do you start talking about valuations? Whoa. Um, well, I mean, when it's appropriate is the first one. So is it appropriate in the first meeting? No. I think you really need to move to a second meeting. Because often this is really just a, we, we, need to get an, a, we need to get an evaluation of whether there's something here. It may not actually be the whole team that you're meeting with. They may need to bring some other people in. It might be an associate you're meeting with or a partner. So again, it comes back to the context. If, if all those people aren't there and they haven't fully gone in to what you're offering them, because you've got a lot more to show them, you probably have a binder and you want to maybe split off with a couple of team members, maybe bring a few additional people, that sort of goes, well, you know, I'd like to do another meeting. Why don't you bring your CTO? Sounds amazing. Uh, really like to meet him. Sounds unbelievable. And, uh, you know, do you mind if I talk to uh, so-and-so, the lawyer that you mentioned? Uh, we know each other really well. I'm playing tennis with them next week. They'll do a lot of that because they're smart. They're going to see if some of those things check out. Until you really get to that phase, don't talk valuation. It's premature. Okay. So, you know, is it, there's, there's three rules. Is it needful? Is it truthful? Is it kind? Not needful on the first meeting. Thank so you. So you don't, you don't want to blow it. Thank you for your presentation. That's great. Lots of stuff. Uh, two quick questions. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Brandon and just, uh, you know, as a, as a presenter when you pitch in, the whole idea of branding yourself and talking about, telling your story on a regular basis and just what that means as a brand. That's the first question. The second question is, I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about um, the importance of reading your audience and the, the pauses to allow yourself time to just read your audience and when, you, when right. you're doing the pitch. Thank you. Well, and I, I mean, that also relates um, to letting other people talk. If I could extend your question, you know, who talks and in, in, in transitions. If you're actually going to allow in a boardroom presentation, I've, I've seen very good jobs of like, say, two, maybe a CTO and a CEO doing the pitch together and they do a handoff. And they maybe do a little bit of a quality check at that point to make sure everybody's okay. So if there, if there aren't any further questions, I'm going to turn the laptop over to Bob, who's going to take you through uh, this section. I, I've seen that done very well. Generally, in ballroom presentations, though, you're pacing yourself, as you said, and it's one single person. So that's an important point that I wanted to make as well. Often just the CEO talks at angel groups, for instance, often a required rule. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about personal branding, because I mean, I, we could go on, and I, I'm not quite sure how that fits in. I mean, if you've established a personal brand, it certainly gets easier to raise money. But as branding relates to the pitch, I, I can talk to that. And I'll tell you that we've actually had to do some high-speed branding for companies that just had great technology, but the way they were presenting their logos and stuff, there were no, no time put into it at all, and they looked really bad. So I say remove any stupid logos that you may have done that might have been done by your brother-in-law in PowerPoint, not in InDesign or something. It happens a lot, and it's not helping you. So just go with a nice word mark and use a, you know, you can fix it in 30 seconds. And we've actually did a word mark that was so good he wanted business cards with that. And, it, you know, we just we actually had to do some high-speed branding for a very gifted scientist here in Mars before he went to the Valley for uh, a presentation that he had to give, and it went very well. But it could have been a disastrous with the kind of cards and everything else that he had. Because I don't know, that, that actually, it's a whole package we're buying as investors, right? 
So you're telling me you got great technology, you got good advisors, and then I see something that looks so hideous. I go, how could it get by all these people? Like, there's something wrong here. So I, I hate to say it, but it's 100%. You've got to be firing right across. There, there's no crap allowed in certain elements of your, of your company. And, and that is that first impression. So it's important that if you are into deep science and you go, oh, I don't know anything about branding. You know, I, don't, I didn't even think it matters. Well, ask those probing questions as to how are you coming across? Does this look good to you? Do a bit more of that to make sure that and make sure that people aren't just being kind. Don't just ask your mother. <laughs> ask other people. Uh, that's an important point, I think, around branding as well and just how you package things overall. Hopefully that's helpful. Peter, sometimes it's very important when you make the presentation, both in terms of um, the um, calendar for the, for the VCs and for yeah, right. time of day. Is there anything that's a rule of thumb, like when to approach people in terms of best let's set it for December, or is it better to do it in May, or is it, are there any rules of thumb around that? Jeez, I mean, I, have we got labor-sponsored funds anymore? Because that, <laughs> that would have been a, that would have been a big uh, factor in terms of timing, because a lot of deals were done at Christmas. But, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't know if there's a really hard and fast rule. I will say this, that high net worth people, angel investors, very hard to find them during March break when a lot of them have other places. They go to Europe or they go to Florida or, um, and in the summertime, you know, Muskoka's and stuff. There is a, a clear uh, absence of, of high net worth individuals that you need to get to that are also VCs in some cases and that calendar cycle. So those are the two biggest ones, the regular holidays, um, you know, uh, as well as those cycles of summer and uh, uh, that's about it. The reason that's I was right. asking, I'm a recovering banker and I'm always yeah. trying to figure out, you used to deal with some of your clients around when their tax time was and yeah. when you, they were um, dealing with issues such as that. So I didn't know if when you were planning yeah. your pitch, if you should be a little strategic about who you're dealing with and at what point. That's it's a very from. good question. I, I think it, you know, if you're raising angel investments, you know, twenty-five and fifty thousand dollar checks from people, everybody's going to have a different cycle they're working on. Some people have got bonus payments coming in from the banks in the spring, you know, um, coincident with tax time. It just it's when Porsche sales spike as well. It's probably very correlated with that. Ask your Porsche dealer um, what the cycle should be on when you raise money. So one more question and. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I also want to get our CEOs up, and, and they're going to remain after for a few minutes to talk uh, about the pitch process with you guys and um, give you a bit of insight from the trenches because they're, they're fresh off of financing. Um, last question. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, my business partner and I are actually in the Upstart competition. We're the hot plate. Oh. And um, right now, I'm just creating... Sorry, the what what the hot it? plate? Oh, you got the name of the company in there. Yeah. Very good. What, what was it again? Uh, the hot plate. The hot plate. So we're dot, a... Dot com? <laughs> dot net. Dot net. As long as it's not dot moby. <laughs> no. Okay. Good. Um, so in creating the slides right now, um, we actually are both arts backgrounds from McGill University, so Excel is a very, very new tool for us. And uh, in creating the financial and metrics slide, what we're hoping to be able to do is to not only display the financial aspect, but also how that intersects with our metrics and our impressions. And just wondering your thoughts on that, if they should be completely separate slides or if it's okay to show some type of an intersection on how we see the growth in each, just to highlight that. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Are you, are you saying you want to stylize the financial slide? Um, I, I wouldn't say stylize. I mean more just in a graphical sense with a line graph um, showing um, you know, a, a line for one, the growth with impressions over, say, five years, and then also for how you see the financial growth and yeah. how those two not only relate um, in terms of growth, but also in terms of milestones. I, I'm a traditionalist. I just generally go for a, a standard financial table. Okay. And Perfect. then you can have that as supporting, you know, in an appendix if you want to give people a more visual way of how other things, because you're creating a dashboard. Absolutely. It's a great idea to actually have dashboards of various things. So how does average rate per user, ARPU, you know, go up? Uh, what's, our, what's our cost of acquisition? If you've got a dashboard that's kind of firing and you can show relationships with the data, it's great. 
Perfect. Really Thank good. you so much. Yeah, and I, I think that actually begs that other question about what goes in the appendix. If you're having major disagreements in your team or with your advisors and you just are at an impasse, remember, I've never heard anybody say that appendix is too big. It's just, uh, except my doctor actually had it. <laughs> uh, I just made that up. But, uh, but no, you, you, you don't get fried for that, but you will for having too many slides in the, in the, in the standard presentation. Perfect. So again, this is only 12 minute format. There's a million different ways to do this. Everybody has a different style. If you want to follow Guy Kawasaki, he's an amazing guy. I can vouch for him. Uh, and he has just another style of doing this. Everybody's different. You have to talk to a lot of people, a lot of your advisors at Myers and other places to get this right. So we're going to wrap this up. And we're going to take uh, some questions off the podium here with our CEO. So please stick around. And uh, we've got another 20 minutes uh, until everybody has to leave. Thanks. It's, uh, I just, uh, well, I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to do two things. Uh, I do want to remember to thank CIBC as our sponsors. Always thank the sponsors. And I want to thank you for participating in the course. Uh, it's your attendance here that, uh, that makes us put this on, that gets the sponsors, that really turns our crank, that that we're doing something helpful for you. So thank you, and uh, to the upstart competitors, good luck. Hope to see you all there. Thanks. Mm -hmm.